Hey wood turners, welcome to my shop. I've had my Barracuda 2 wood turning chuck for a little over two years now, and having put it through its paces, I thought I'd take the time to show you guys what I think. So I'm gonna be going over some pros and cons as well as some tips to help you get the most out of this thing. So this is Penn State's mid-size chuck offering. It's about three and a half inches in diameter, which puts it puts it in the ballpark of the Nova G3 or the Hurricane 100. Um, its main pro is that it's inexpensive. So there's two models, two kits for the, the Barracuda 2. Um, the, the base model is 180 bucks and you get three jaws, two jaws, uh, pin, the spindle jaws, the woodworm thing, as well as an adapter. And then as you can see here, I have the extra special titanium nitride coated edition, more on that later. So this is around 230. And in addition to this stuff, you get some coal jaws and a spindle adapter. So if you add up the, um, the base price as well as the, the price of the jaws, um, each individual jaw kit for the other chuck brands, you'll find that they're typically in the mid $200 range. Whereas with the uh, Barracuda 2, you're out of the door for 180 bucks. So for a, a new wood turner who wants to experiment with different sized pieces, um, different ways to hold their work, the Barracuda 2 really is a good deal. Um, because for under 200 bucks, you get a variety of jaws that are gonna get you out of whatever situation you might find yourself in. If I only had my two jaws, the ones that come with the other kits, um, I mean, I wouldn't be able to say drill pen blanks in my lathe. Uh, if I didn't have a drill press, that'd be really inconvenient because these, the step jaws, which I hardly ever use the step part for, uh, the inter-neural part here really works really well for pen blanks. Um, having really large three jaws lets you do big bowls securely. And the pin jaws are good for odds and ends, uh, very small recesses or holding spindles. So it's a good value. Um, <clears throat> it gets you out of the door quickly. Now with that said, that's about the only really strong pro for the chuck. There's many more cons. They're not super serious cons, but there's things to keep in mind. So the number one con that I can see is that Penn State only offers the straight profiled serrated jaws for the Barracuda 2. Uh, what that means is that the jaw profiles are not dovetailed as you hear lots and lots about. Um, everything is square. So if you're going to be making a tendon or a mortise for any one of these jaws, you make it straight, no dovetails. And those, the shark, the shark tooth or serrated jaws, they rely upon these small serrations to dig into the wood to provide the, the real firm grip. Um, this works pretty well, except that it relies upon crushing the wood a little bit, squishing the fibers. So if you do have a piece that pops out, it can be sometimes difficult to get it seated perfectly back into place because the fibers have been crushed. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, but with that said, I, with, with using properly sized tenons and mortises um, as compared to my work, I don't have any problems with my stuff popping out. Um, over the past two weekends, I processed like four maple logs. And for my larger bowls, say, I don't know, seven inches and above in diameter, I use a large recess or a large mortise or tenon for my three jaws. Um, and I mean, it was really, really solid. I didn't have a single bowl pop out over I know, like 15 or 20 bowls. And I mean, I was, I was working my lathe really, really well, um, stalling it because it's only one horse lathe. Um, so if you, if you do your tens right and your mortise is right, just make them nice and square. The serrated jaws work fine. Another con about the chuck is that the set screws are kind of soft. Um, as I'll talk about later, you don't want to over torque these things because they will round out a little bit. In fact, looking in here, um, I can see a couple of the hex holes have a little bit of mushrooming to their inside lip. So you kind of want to be careful with these things. Um, and I guess another sort of minor um, con about the chuck 
is that it's a, essentially an open back design. So the, the, the TN edition does have a back plate, but it hardly guards the internals of the chuck against dust. Um, through this huge hole which the key goes into, the, the gear is still exposed. And looking in there, there's still you know a moderate amount of dust and grime. Um, it's really not a, a big deal in my, my opinion. I think I've cleaned this thing out once in the two years that I've had it, and it works fine with the open back design. I mean, one way makes open back chucks and everyone holds them in fairly high regard. So that's not something I obsess too much over. Here's some tips and tricks for how to get the most use out of your chuck. So the one I'm gonna start off with is a spiel about straight tenons. So here's my number two jaw. And as you can see, the actual mating area for the serrated bit is straight. Um, both the inside and the outside are straight. It sort of looks like there's a dovetail here with this with this curve, but all that is is um, a recess to allow the serrated teeth to bite into the mortise in this case. So for both the two and the three three jaws, make your mortises and tenons real. It's just simple, straight straight on ninety degree angles. Um, if you if you read turning literature articles and books, you'll find authors talking about dovetailed tenons and mortises because the higher end chucks all come with dovetailed jaws. Um, this is not higher end chuck, doesn't have <laughs> dovetailed jaws, so uh, don't don't make those. When I started out making bowls, I always made dovetailed tenons because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. Um, I just hadn't looked at these jaws closely enough. It was kind of a dumb mistake. And, and consequently, my work was insane in the chuck. Um, it's only until I figured out that my my tenons weren't shaped right that I really had starting good success with this thing. Uh, the second tip is the perfect circle um, strategy in putting your jaws in. Um, I'll link to a Mike Walt video who goes into that much, much better than I will. But basically, when you put your, if you want a very, very straight um, work holding, work holding session, um, put your jaws on in a perfect circle. Don't just slap them on and tighten your screws down and assume that everything's going to be perfectly lined up because it won't be. Um, secondly is the torque for putting your little set screws in. As I mentioned earlier, these set screws are, they're soft. They're not, you know, some super fancy hard material. And I've, I stripped one of these out one time and now is a, a sad camper. So just don't use a lot of torque when you're putting these things in. I'll, I'll demonstrate the torque that I use. Um, so this is a, a cheapo Harbor Freight um, hex key because I, I broke the hex key that came with this chuck. Probably when I was applying too much torque to these things. And I always use the long end, um, the, the end that gives you least torque because you're up here. Um, I do not use the uh, maximum torque mode because you don't need to caveman these things. So I'm going to take this one off. go. This is hard with the band-aid. All right, one jaw is off. So I'm going to put this guy back on and show you what kind of torque I use. And it's not a lot. The usual technique is to get one finger tight, get the other one going. All right, here we go. So that and that. Basically, I just let this spring a little bit. Um, Nothing more than that. And I'll, here's what it sounds like when I take it off. So, yeah, that's, it's an appropriate amount of chuck for, or amount of torque for a small screw like that. So don't overdo it. My last piece of advice is around how to size your mortises and tenons. So your goal when doing either is to maximize the surface area contact between your chuck and your work. When I first started out, I would more or less eyeball my tenon sizes. Um, and I would wind up with situations like this, where the tendon was too big for the jaws, and I, would, I wouldn't have full contact on the inside of the jaw. You can see the gap here. I would only have these two corners digging into the work. And what happens there is that these corners do dig in, and you can certainly tighten your chuck down really, really tight to get those to dig in. But because there's such a small amount of area for these the metal jaws to work against the wood, the fibers continue to get damaged. They continue to compress. 
So you either need to apply more torque with your chuck key, or once your piece flies off the lathe, you then go to a fresh spot. And you can have a firm holding again, but your work's going to be off-centered because the wood is going to compress differently. Um, it's not going to be in the same spot. So if you think about the numbers in terms of, say, the, the square inches of contact area, um, say for these three jaws, the, the number of square inches of contact around this full inner, inner circumference is, is far, far greater than eight of these, these corners digging into the work. I mean, that's why chuck jaw manufacturers make <laughs> dovetails around the, the insides and the outsides. Uh, or they do these serrations that they intend for you to use this area. <clears throat> so make your make your mortise and tennises um, as small as possible. Um, it's sometimes misleading that the uh, chuck manufacturers list these these large ranges for um, each jaw size. You know, like two and a half inches through like four inches. Um, yeah, if you have some really weird piece of work, you can you can use uh, a, a dovetail jaws for a large, a large size tenon, but this is not the best way to hold it. There's only eight points of contact right now. So when I'm doing dry work, I will make my tenons around one eighth of an inch bigger than uh, the minimum size calls for. And that's simply to afford these, these inner serrations, um, a little bit of extra wood to bite into. When I'm doing a mortise in dry work, I, I this real easy. I just make it the minimum size, basically, for enough for the, the chuck to fit into, and then I expand out into the work. Uh, green, green wood is a touch more complicated. So for uh, tendons, I will usually make those around three eighths of an inch bigger than I need to. And that's because your tenon, as your, your wood shrinks, it shrinks more in this direction than this direction. So your tenon is gonna shrink over time. You're losing material. So when you want to, want to remount that bowl, um, you're probably going to jam chuck on a lathe, support it with the tail stock, and you're going to turn away some of this material to get it back to a circle. So again, you're losing material. So that's why I make mine a little bit oversized, three is an inch or, you know, whatever your number turns out to be. Just uh, keep that in mind. Otherwise, when you come back to a, a dry bowl with an undersized tenon, you'll either have to turn it down to the next size or figure out some other means of holding your work. It's a pain in the butt, kind of disappointing. Now for green mortises, again, those are real simple. So I just make those the minimum size as the jaws call for. So again, uh, your mortise will, will shrink over time and shrink and warp, but mortises are convenient in that as you remove material to true them up, um, you can always continue to expand in that direction. Obviously you don't want to expand too far because then you'll start to diminish the amount of surface area contact um, but we're talking like, you know, a quarter inch here, so it's not a big deal. So mortises are quite a bit simpler in that regard. Let's go over the differences between the two kits, the titanium nitride and the standard edition. So the main thing is that with the TN kit, you get some coal jaws and a spindle or a spur drive. Uh, the coal jaws are just okay. So they're, they're small, as you can see. Um, <clears throat> they're only good for bowls up to five inches in diameter. So if you find yourself um, reverse chucking a lot of really small work, go for them. Um, I've used these, oh, I don't know, six times in the two years that I've had the thing. Most of my, my bowls are six, six inches or greater, so I just use my hand-built uh, Longworth chuck. So these don't get a lot of action in my shop. And sec the second improvement is this horrible uh, <laughs> spur drive. So um, out of the box, the, the castings are, are really, really rough and poorly done. So these little teeth were hardly sharp. Um, so I went over these with the, a diamond paddle and got them to feel sharp, but they're just so small that they don't really bite in, into the work at all. And, and your spindle just spins out. So I've used this a few times and now it just sits on my shelf collecting dust. Um, I just used the spur drive that came with my lathe. Um, this thing's a piece of crap. Oh, let's see. What else? Uh, oh, the back cover. So as I mentioned before, the back cover sort of protects the, the chuck from dust. Um, and it also does have indexing if your lathe doesn't have an indexing feature, so that's cool. But uh, 
as you can see that this these holes are huge so you're really not protecting the internals of the chuck from any kind of dust or grime um, <clears throat> and lastly there's the the tn coating itself um, as you can see it it's it wears off so if you errantly hit your chuck jaws with any sandpaper the the cool gold coating is just going to come right off so this is not something i would uh, buy this edition for the chuck for um, but if you find it on sale you know go for it um it is it is nice having the cold jaws just in case um, i got this off of amazon warehouse deal as an open item for i think 200 bucks so i'm not too upset with that purchase well, that's about all I have to say about this thing. If anyone has any questions about the chuck, we'd be more than happy to answer any questions about it down in the comments. Thanks for watching.